So welcome to our third hybrid meeting. First of all, some Zoom pointers that we're going to repeat again on your Zoom screen. You should see a Q&A icon somewhere on it, and you can ask questions through that icon when we get to that point. We will today be repeating the questions so that everybody will hear them. We also would like you to have the best experience, so please mute. This is for the Zoom and turn off your video. Okay, and now to introduce Lindsay. Lindsay is gonna to speak to us today about the principles of plant disease spread and management. Lindsay is an animal lover and avid runner, and she hails from Durban, South Africa. Dr. Lindsay Detois is a professor and extension plant pathologist at WSU's Mount Vernon Research and Extension Center. She studies the origin, spread, patterns, and management of diseases affecting important vegetable crops around the globe. She's internationally recognized for her work protecting valuable seed crops from disease. Dr. Detois earned her bachelor's degree in plant pathology at the University of Natal, Peter Maritzburg, South Africa, and holds advanced degrees in plant pathology from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. In August 2022, she received the honor of fellowship in the American Phytopathology Society. The fellowship recognizes members with distinguished contributions to the science and their society, including original research, teaching, leadership, and outreach. Thank you for speaking to us today. Can you all hear me? I think there's a low battery light on my <laughs> microphone, so <laughs> I may need to switch microphone. Can you all hear me at the back? Great. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I did warn Lana when she asked me, invited me, that um, I mostly work with vegetables. I am, have not worked with ornamentals for 23 years. I was a plant diagnostician at the WCPR Research and Extension Center for a couple of years before I took this position. So I had two years of immersement in uh, a lot of the landscaping ornamental issues. I also, during my graduate uh, studies, worked for the plant clinic at the University of Illinois. So I had five summers of uh, tremendous mentoring from the diagnostician on, and a lot of it was garden landscape uh, nursery type of thing. So. I have a little bit of ornamental knowledge, but um, most of my examples today are going to be vegetables, and I hope that's not too uh, off-putting, but the principles remain the same. So I'll try to focus on the principles and less on the minutia of the specific example. But, um, so you have a plant problem, <laughs> and you need to figure out what it is. I was asked to talk about diseases in particular. Now, does the word disease has a lot of connotations depending on who you talk to. Sometimes Pest. The word pest includes diseases, insects, all kinds of things. But um, I'm going to focus today on um, plant problems that can be divided into biotic and abiotic. Okay. And those are really important distinctions to know. A biotic problem is caused by a living organism. And it can be anything from insects, mites, can be true pathogens, it could be deer, it could be that there's a living organism associated with it. The abiotic, a meaning non, bio meaning living. So non-living causes are things like the physical environmental stress or chemical damage or mechanical injury, things that are non-living that are causing the problem. Today, I'm gonna to be focusing on this group, I'll use the laser pointer since they're Zoom folks, um, on the, the fungal, bacterial, bio nematode type issues. So they tend to be microscopic pathogens, usually require sort of lab type equipment to be able to see them. But that's what we classify as diseases in the world of plant pathology. So hopefully just to set, set that right. Um, and just to also help you rec recognize some of the diagnostic resources, I think many of you know the diagnostic resources that are available since you're part of a garden club, you probably connect with the master gardeners, you have your master gardener clinics. But the one that is certainly relevant to Western Washington is Jenny Glass at the Piala uh, Plant Clinic. And if you're not sure what you're working with, you're not sure if it's a disease, that's a really important thing. You can start implementing management practices, but if you've got the wrong thing in mind, um, you could be doing completely the wrong thing in terms of management. So cannot emphasize enough the importance of accurate diagnosis. 
Um, there's lots of wonderful resources available for you to sort of do some of your own digging around and searching for uh, what, what things might be. The Pacific Northwest Disease Management Handbook is a wonderful resource. It gets revised every year. It's online. It's got um, incredible resources. On the vegetable side of things, I, I run the vegetable extension group, PNW Veg. We have a photo gallery with all kinds of photos of vegetable problems in this area. Um, and hort sense is geared more towards home gardening uh, problems that are common in Washington, if you're not familiar with those already. So getting back to the, the actual pathogens and the disease spread and management. Um, it's Some of you have taken biology, this will be old hat, but for some of you don't, it, it, it can be important to recognize the, these different groups of key plant pathogens. So we have the classic fungi that most of us are familiar with. And then we have these things we call oomycetes, which used to be called fungi. They're also known as water molds. They include things like pythium, downy mildews, late blight on potatoes. And the reason they're called water molds and no longer referred to as fungi is if you look at these organisms, their cell walls are made mostly of cellulose, which is what plant cell walls are made of. True fungi, the walls are mostly made of chitin. So they're completely unrelated. But they look similar. You can grow them on a petri plate. They're fuzzy and moldy, and they can look really similar. So they used to be categorized as fungi. They've now been separated out. And that becomes really important for a number of management principles we'll, we'll discuss. But if you, for example, do spray a chemical, if you're someone who might want to use a fungicide, the fungicides that work against true fungi are not the same as the fungicides that work against water molds because they have totally different structures and cell walls and, and so on. And that's where it becomes really important as, as well as other principles. Um, so this is actually a drawing of a plant cell, sort of a typical size plant cell. And here you can see the, the hyph hyphum or mycelium of a fungus kind of growing into the cell, just to give you an idea of relative size. Um, and then we have this category of things called bacteria. And here's a bacterial cell, single celled, very simple. They often have this thing that helps them swim. And that's why most bacterial pathogens do well in the presence of water. You need splashing water or rain or something for them to swim around and be able to uh, uh, reproduce. And then we have these things called phytoplasmids. Um, they used to be called molecules. The ones that infect plants are called phytoplasmids. They're actually related to bacteria, but they have no wall around them, so they take on these weird shapes. And they're transmitted, always transmitted by things like leaf hoppers and plant hoppers. And when they feed, they get into the phloem tissue, so they actually move systemically through the plant, but only through the phloem. And they take on these weird shapes because it interferes with the growth of the plant. So they're always uh, insect vector. And then you get these viruses. So there's a whole bunch of viruses, classic types of examples. So you can see how tiny these things get. So you're not gonna see most of these things with the naked eye. And then you get another category called viroids. So viruses consist of some nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, surrounded by a shell of protein. Viroids don't even have the protein. They're just a piece of nucleic acid. It gets kind of really complicated when you get down to that tiny level. And there's some very nasty ones. So if, you, if you're if you a hop grower, there's the hop latent viroid, which is a big problem for hop production um, in places like Yakima Valley. Um, and then you get uh, these things called nematodes. So nematodes, sometimes like people like to lump them with the insects, and some people lump them with the pathogens, because this is the head of a nematode uh, protruding into a plant cell. And they look like microscopic worms, but they're not worms, they're not segmented, they're not in the animals, they're in their own phylum. Um, and they have this, most of them, have, plant parasitic ones have this dagger-like structure called a stylet in their head that they use to pierce the plant cells. And then they damage the cell, pierce it, and suck up the contents from the plant cell. So you can see this wide range of size, and, and this all has a little bit of relevance in the helping spray, helping you so just so why do you need to know um, what you're dealing with? So we have three different diseases on, on the screen. A little bit of a glare, sorry, with the lights. I don't know if we can turn the front lights off there. That way, we'll see things. Thank you. Try the other one. There we go. That's much better. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so anyone have brassicas? Anyone have any idea of what it might be? If you get them wrong, it's okay. There's no grade in here. <laughs> so these are three different diseases of brassicas and three from three totally unrelated types of pathogens. So on the left-hand side, um, 
is downy mildew. So this is the lowest surface of the leaf. We see this in the winter or spring when we've had a lot of moisture, it's cooler temperatures, and you see the, the I was gonna say fungus, but it's not a true fungus, it's a water mold. The pathogen produces all these spores through the stomata on the lower surface of the leaf, right? And the middle one is black rot. Sorry, this is a bacterial pathogen, and it likes heat. It does really well in warmer temperatures, unlike the downy mildew. Um, and it gets into the, you can see how it's starting to move this, these V-shaped lesions on the edge of the leaf, and I'll explain shortly with another example of why that is the case. And then on the right-hand side is a disease called blackleg, and it's caused by a true fungus. So here, all on brassicas, three totally different diseases with very different causal agents and some very important differences in management. The other thing that's important besides knowing what the diseases that you're dealing with is understanding a little bit about the life cycle. So these pathogens have to reproduce, they have to spread, they have to survive, they have to infect the plant somehow. And if you can read up a little bit about the disease that you're working with, you can start to understand where is the Achilles heel in the life cycle. Some pathogens, there's a very narrow window of opportunity to control them. And others, there's multiple places where you can implement management strategies. And so it's important to understand a little bit about the disease cycle. And can you find the Achilles heel in that life cycle or heels, <laughs> Achilles heels, if there's more than one, where you can be effective at getting that disease in check. And other times you'll be wasting the time and money and resources. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to understand a little bit about it. Um, and the other important thing, this is a really fundamental principle that I teach our graduate students and I go back to over and over again in my own work when I'm asked to help a grower with a problem is the disease triangle. So how many of you have heard of this disease, infamous disease triangle? Okay, some, a few of you have and others haven't. So in order to have disease, you have to have three things. You have to have the pathogen. The inoculum has to come from somewhere. And the more pathogen you have, the more inoculum, the longer the side of the triangle, okay? You have to have an environment that is favorable for that pathogen. I, me I mentioned how black rot likes heat, downy mildew likes cool, and the more favorable the conditions are for that disease, the longer this side of the triangle is going to be. And you have to have a susceptible host. If you don't have a host, you're not gonna have the disease. If you, the more susceptible that host is, the longer the side of the triangle is. So the, size of that triangle, the area inside that triangle represents how much disease might develop. So one of the things you can think about in management is can you reduce the size of one, the, the length of one or more of the sides of this triangle? And it seems kind of simple, but over and over again, when you're looking at a disease, trying to figure out how to manage it, going back to this and saying, do I have the capacity to reduce the amount of inoculum? Do I have the capacity to reduce the favorability of the environment? Do I have the capacity to, um, sorry, you might want to go out. Sorry, we can hear you. <laughs> uh, reduce the susceptibility of the host in some manner. So, for example, if I can reduce the favorability of the environment, let's say I can move, um, I'm planting a certain crop or I want to plant something in the yard, and I know there's a risk of a foliar fungal disease that likes high humidity, likes wetness of the leaves. Can I move it into a spot in the yard where there's better airflow, better air movement through the yard? The canopy will dry up much quicker after rains. Um, I, I tell the selective growers, is, is there a predominant wind direction? Can you take advantage? Wind is your friend for most of these fungal and water mold and bacterial diseases because they need moisture to do their thing. And the quicker the canopy can dry out, the better. So can you reduce that side of the triangle? Now you've got a smaller triangle compared to this. You may not have eliminated the disease, but you may get it to a manageable level. Or can you reduce the amount of inoculum? Let's say, for example, black spot on rose, you know, any rose grows bane, you've got all these leaves that are infected, they fall on the ground. What's that inoculum going to do? Can you get rid of that inoculum, get, break the leaves up or incorporate them into the soil? You know, make sure that you get that inoculum out of there, you'll have less inoculum the next season. So there are ways that you can try to reduce the size of that triangle. And if you can reduce all three by selecting a variety that has resistance, for example, maybe it's only partial resistance, you still got some disease, but not so bad, you get a smaller and smaller triangle. And if you can eliminate any one of those sides, you have a flat line, you no longer have any area. So you've eliminated the disease. It could be elimination of the favorability of your environment. It could be elimination of the host by having a not even planting that host, <laughs> or going to something that has complete resistance if it's available. Some diseases, there is no 
complete resistance, um, or can you completely get rid of inoculum? So this is, you know, it's a somewhat simple concept, but over and over again, when you run into these complicated situations working with growers, I keep going back to this in my head. What can we do to reduce one or more sides of the triangle to get that disease pressure down? So plant pathogens spread. This is the first question I was asked to address is how do pathogens spread? And there's a number of ways they spread. One of them is by wind. Now we do we get wind out here? <laughs> okay. Not all pathogens are, are predominantly spread this way, but the ones that really tend to be problematic are the foliar diseases where the pathogen has evolved to kind of release its spores or its propagules to be moved in the wind. So foliar fungal pathogens and these water mold um, pathogens like downy mildews, late mite and potatoes, when you know. Central Washington's a major potato production region. If one field gets late blight, an emergency notice goes out to all the surrounding farms because of the speed with which that late blight pathogen can be blown in the wind. Okay. Water. Water can disperse pathogens. Um, as I mentioned, the fungi, the water molds, the bacteria all need moisture to do their thing. And water is a driver of dispersal. It could be that if you know if you've got an irrigation pond and it's draining out from another field. Or Pathogens present, or it just could be you know, be spread in the splash in the water. Many fungi are designed to have their spores produced in some kind of a structure, a fruiting body, with it's a sort of gelatinous matrix. So it's designed as that rain hits it, it splashes it out, and that gelatinous matrix protects those spores while they're getting established and germinating on the host surface. So some fungi are specifically have specifically evolved for splash dispersal, and others have evolved for wind dispersal. Um, bacteria and nematodes all need moisture. They're in, the nematodes are typically in the soil so, and they have to swim around. So they have to have moisture in the soil and, and water running off fields potentially could move to, uh, things like that. Some of these are soil borne. So the true soil borne pathogens moving infected soil can be a source of inoculum, source of, of spread of inoculum. And this is something we talk to growers about quite a bit because let's say you go to an auction and you're buying a piece of equipment and it's a piece of equipment that you know, you know, might be a cultivator or something. If you're bringing that back to your farm and it's covered with soil from where it was, you know, originally used, you potentially are moving pathogens with that soil. And so, just making sure that um, that, that you clean that equipment. And this is actually quite problematic for some um, co-ops that I work with. For example, up in you know, around Bellingham area or areas where you're close to cities and you've got a lot of smaller farms, they don't have the resources to buy all the equipment themselves, themselves individually, so they share equipment. This becomes a common source of spread of pathogens is moving soil on equipment on the tires. Uh, even if you walk a lot between farms, um, cleaning your boots off between fields is really important. So um, if I'm going into a farm where I know there's a pathogen that's soil borne, that's a problem, I will either take disposable booties and I can pull over my boots, like tie back booties, pull over my, sometimes some of them along, um, or I'll take, I always carry alcohol spray bottles and not the drinking type in my state vehicle <laughs> uh, to spray off my boots and hands. And, and so I'm not moving pathogens between fields. Um, planting material. So some pathogens can be seed borne, some pathogens can be carried on transplants. Uh, vegetatively propagated materials are a big, big uh, risk if you're not careful with some pathogens. So garlic, for example, we don't have true garlic seed, we have the cloves. And spreading, you know, we all love to share our garlic. <laughs> That's a very common source of dissemination of, of materials. I, I do a lot of uh, educational programming with seed production, including with organic seed producers, and there's a strong grassroots seed production movement in Western Washington, you know, to try and help people be able to produce their own seed. And I always warn them that you, when you exchange seed, you do not want to be exchanging diseases either, uh, pathogens as well. Mm -hmm. So just this consciousness of how do you keep your seed from becoming infected and not spread that on with the seed. That's a big reason I was hired by WSU is to work with the vegetable seed industry in the state, in the Pacific Northwest, because we produce seed that's sold all over the world. And selling pathogens with seed is not a good thing. <laughs> um, uh, insects. Some insects are vectors of some pathogens. So, for example, thrips carry um, the, the bane of greenhouse producers is tomato spotted wilt virus or impatiens necrotic spot virus. They're carried by thrips. They love flowers, they love pollen. 
And so if you're a greenhouse flower producer or even like a pepper or tomato producer, these viruses can become extremely um, devastating if, you, if you're not careful about controlling the insects. Aphids can carry certain viruses, uh, certain phytoplasmids. Leaf up, as I mentioned, carry phytoplasmids. So these are problems that we tend not to see quite as much on the west side as the east side. Insects like drier climates and wetter climates. So the insect vector problems are much more problematic on the east side of the mountains because the insects do thrive better typically in a drier climate. Um, actually, and there are some fungi that transmit viruses, and they are nematodes that transmit viruses. So you start getting into this chain of microbes, spreading microbes. Um, um, nematode transmitted viruses can be very serious for some industries like potato production. There's some nematodes that transmit viruses that make the tubers all necrotic inside. And so when they cut them open for making fries or chips or whatever it might be, they can't use them. And so there's very low tolerance for these nematode transmitted viruses in poor potato producers. And then, of course, humans and other animals, things can also move uh, some of these pathogens around. And I'll mention some examples coming up. But if you're working in a field um, and it's wet and, you know, which how many times a year is it wet around here? <laughs> and it, particularly if you're growing, for example, the tall brassica crop and you're walking through and you're harvesting kale leaves to sell at the farmer's market every week. And when it's wet and if there's bacterial infections, you could be carrying the bacteria on the, the wet stuff that you move along. And as you're pulling the leaves off, you could be spreading the bacteria. So it's one of the reasons certain pathogens do well in our climate here in Western Washington, because we do have extended periods of leaf wetness, which um, uh, loan themselves towards uh, dispersal. All right, so I had this picture up on my first slide. Um, anyone know what crop this is? Mm -hmm. Okay, so cabbage in the front, and there's another cabbage, a green cabbage in the back, and behind that's a flowering broccoli field. On the this side of the crop was a uh, kale field. So this is a, a sort of small to medium sized farm, not here on this island, but somewhere in Western Washington. And last fall, I got a phone call saying, I think we have a problem in this field. So what do you notice the symptoms? The, uh, the, the orange, brown, yellowing type symptoms. So if I do a close up, so this is that black rot pathogen I showed you earlier. This is actually a quarantine disease for parts of six counties in Western Washington because it's very rarely seaborne, very rarely sea transmitted. In the early 1970s, outbreaks of black rot in cabbage in the Midwest and the East Coast were all tied to seed grown in Washington state. So the disease has been made a quarantine disease because we want to keep it out of this area. We, the, the beauty we have is we're not a hot region, so the disease tends to not do well here, but if it gets on seed, it's highly explosive. So there's zero tolerance for it on seed. Seed growers have to, seed companies have to test 30,000 seed from every lot. If any seed, one in 30,000 seed is positive, they cannot sell that seed. So we have a quarantine in place to, to try and avoid introducing black rot on seed that gets planted in this area. It's not to prevent people from planting, but it's to try and prevent um, influxes of inoculum on seed that people buy seed from non-certified type of sources. Okay. So this unfortunately was was this is one of the worst outbreak I've ever seen of black rot. And you can see this crop was infected, the one behind it was infected, the kale to the north of it was infected. And this is a crop destruction requirement mm -hmm. under the quarantine. Eighty percent of this farm is brassicas. Oh, no. Okay, so this is real. This is not a fictitious story I'm making up. Um, but this is where diseases become problematic. And how do you work to try and prevent this? And this grower um, is harvesting kale every week and selling on farmers markets th throughout the year. And you know, we had to work with this farmer and the State Department of Agriculture to quarantine or fence off the areas that were infected, survey where the disease had spread, implement a management plan to get rid of that inoculum, and try to prevent that farm from being a source for his own crops next season. So um, pretty serious problem. So Pete, this was black rot. There's the name of the pathogen. Um, now, I asked you why it's coming in on the edge of the leaf. So have you ever been into a field, particularly in the fall, when, when the days are warm, the nights are cool, and you get lots of views, and you see these droplets on the edge of the leaf here? Can you see that? 
Does anyone know why those form? Okay, so on a warm day, the plant has to take up moisture from the soil because it's transpiring more under the heat. When the temperature cools at night, the stomata flows because of the cold, but there's still all that moisture that the roots have taken up. They have to get rid of it somehow. So they push that moisture out through the ends of the veins. Where the veins come to the edge of the leaf, there's a tiny opening called a hydrothode. Okay, and that moisture collects like this through the hydrothodes. And then in the next day, as temperature warms up, what happens to those droplets? They get sucked back in. Now, there's bacteria that land on the surface of the leaf and they happen to encounter and get into that droplet of water. They get sucked in through the, through the hydrothode into the leaf. And that's why most of these lesions you see on these plants all have these marginal infections that then move down. And when I took a knife and cut along the, the mid rib, the center vein, you can see that black streak. Now, it should all be green. It shouldn't be a black streak. That is xanthomonas moving down systemically down the xylem. And when I cut the stem open, you can see the black areas. That's all. So it had gone fully systemic in those plants. Okay. So just to give you an illustration of disease spread and just now, the, and it also causes it continues to develop in those heads on storage if you're storing the heads and wanting to eat them later or sell them later. This is what we talk about. So I took a knife, and this is under a microscope, cut across the vein. There's a vein, and you can see the bacteria just oozing out by the millions. And they just reproduce like crazy in their xylem tissue spread. So you can see when you're harvesting a kale plant, you're pulling that leaf off, you're exposing the ends of those veins. If they're infected, all that you know, moisture, the juice, whatever it is, is on your hands, you could be moving it as you work down the crop. Okay. And so this is, you know, I've mentioned what the bacteria look like. This is a disease called angular leaf spot that goes to most cucurbits. It's caused by a different bacteria, pseudomonas. But I held the leaf up to the light so you can see how these bacteria, they consist of a single cell. And so they release these enzymes that break down the plant cell around them, and then they can feed on the components. So you get this water-soaked appearance and often restricted by the veins because it takes more enzymes to break down that vein tissue than it does the tissue between the veins. So that's a typical type of symptom of a bacterial infection. There's some other bacterial examples for you. You can often see that water soaking, but once conditions turn warm and dry, the, the tissue will just turn dead, uh, what we call necrotic, just dry and brown. Uh, but this is during that period when it's when it's really moist. So it's halobiota beans that on the pods, on the leaves, and this is a, a carrot disease. You can see the water soaking and um, the tissue that's just deformed by the bacteria. Some bacteria cause a soft rot. You've all seen rotten potatoes, rotten onions, <laughs> uh, particularly with onions, when moisture gets down in that neck, um, it can extend down and rot, just sort of macerating that tissue out. So that you can see the splash dispersal plays a big role in the movement of these bacteria. And that's why trying to get the canopy dried out as best you can after a rain or after a watering is really useful. There, there is a group of bacteria that can be in the soil and actually cause diseases. So you might have heard of scab. Scab goes to potatoes, it goes to carrots, it goes to beets. There's a range of these. So these are not necessarily splash dispersal in that classic form for the polio diseases, but in fact, through the soil and you get, um, sorry, I have to keep pushing the laser pointer. You get these galls that form on the underground tissues, the roots and the uh, crowns and tubers and so on. So how do you manage these diseases? Um, I'm gonna focus most on cultural management, um, particularly because in a home garden, a, a gardening environment, you hope to not have to use chemicals as, as, until the last resort. Um, one of the things you can look at is where you grow things can be really important. To grow things in an environment that's super favorable for problems, you're gonna have problems. <laughs> so on a, on a larger scale, geographic or regionally, I just use this to illustrate this, but I work primarily in vegetable seed production and pathology related to seed production. And most of the seed production in the US takes place in Western states. And why is that? They dry them. If you do a lot of seed production in the Midwest or East Coast states, you have far more disease pressure. Growers and you know, conventional larger scale growers of vegetables in the eastern and midwest states have to deal with far more disease pressure than growers in the western states, except for those insect vector problems I mentioned, because insects like dry conditions. So, um, for example, uh, the bean seed and pea seed production is focused on three states Idaho, Washington, I should include Oregon in there as well. 
primarily because these bacterial pathogens and one fungal pathogen are, are very readily seed borne and seed transmitted and can explode under high humidity and, and high rain conditions. So uh, another example is, is the brassicas. So Western Washington and um, Central Washington are key areas of brassica seed production. Western Washington and Western Oregon are the only place in the U.S. you can grow cabbage seed. That's it. You have to have cold, cold enough winters to cause them to go from vegetative to reproductive growth, but not so cold that it'll kill them. If you try to grow cabbage seed in central Washington, they'll die because the winters are too cold. If you try to grow them too far south, it's too warm. They won't, they won't bolt, you know, vernalize, go through that transition. Same thing with spinach seed. Spinach seed is an annual, not a biennial. So planted in the spring, you harvest the seed it in late summer. But what makes spinach flower? So it's not cold, <laughs> it doesn't go through the winter. It's daylight. So the only place you can grow spinach seed for seed production is in Western Washington and Western Oregon. Spinach doesn't tolerate heat, it needs a long day length, and you need a mild summer because it doesn't, and a dry summer. So the seed is forming when it's dry. Those are the only two places in the entire country to grow spinach seed. So we're selling spinach seed from Washington and, and Western Washington and the Willamette Valley to about 90 countries in the world. And seedborne pathogens become a huge issue with seed trade. So that's the, really the primary focus of my job is helping seed growers produce clean seed. But this, so that geographic or regional location is important. So if we bring it down to local gardening level, you can look for things like avoiding frost pockets, areas prone to fog, excessively wet soils. Some of these, like Pythium, loves wet soils. Um, so if you have a, a heavier soil, uh, my garden is all clay. <laughs> because I'm on top of a hill that's just all clay, rock. <laughs> um, or if you have uh, an area that we get a lot of drainage from a stream or, or you know, from the surrounding hills, you want to avoid crops or plants that are on tolerant of wet soils or that have diseases that are really favored by wet soils. Um, so raised beds can be really helpful for dealing with that if you do have soil problems where you can't get away from drainage issues. Um, and then isolating your crops spatially and temporally because these diseases, these pathogens reproduce and they spread. And how do you prevent that spread? So in areas where you have overlapping annual and biennial crops, so in Western Washington, we have all these seed crops I mentioned, but we also have a lot of brassica growers, kale, cabbage, uh, Brussels sprouts are now big in the Skagit Valley. And there's a number of diseases that go across all these brassicas. They don't care what brassica it is, they go across. So you have this potential green bridge through the winter on the biennial brassicas with the annuals. And there's a lot of opportunity for diseases to keep developing. And that's why things like the quarantine for black rot were put in place to try and provide some protective measures. So what you want to think about from gardening too, uh, the, the diversification is a huge management tool for diseases. We see far less major issues in diversified small-scale farms because they tend to have a, a wide range of crops um, and also in gardens because you tend not to have acres of one species <laughs> okay and I, um, that example I showed you black rot on that farm 80 percent of that farm was brassicas so it was medium scale farm but still a preponderance of was a wide diversity of brassicas but diseases like black rot and black leg go across those that that family of brassicaceae so just keep in mind, diversification is an important management tool. Um, if you do have problems thinking about green bridge and how do you break, we call it a green bridge because it's a bridge for the pathogen to move from one host to the next, one plant to the next, it's green tissue or living tissue in which it can continue to reproduce and survive. So we talk about this a lot in plant pathology is, is there a green bridge spatially and temporally that you need to break if you're struggling with the disease? So I just I give you one example. This is a bacterial disease of carrot I showed you earlier. This is what it can do to the umbels where the seed forms get on the seed. Now you have a problem with infected seed. And we were able to show growers, now carrot seed is biennial. It has to go through the winter to fertilize and produce flowers. We were able to show by trapping, um, we took these petri plates and, and had this, uh, drove a truck at various distances behind a combine that was combining the seed, okay? And we could trap, the pathogen in the airborne dust behind the combine up to a mile downwind. Now these farms are separated, the seed crops are separated by a minimum half mile because of cross-pollination. But this, when the wind's blowing, that dust is blowing a long distance. And so 
they were able to recognize why this disease was building up big time in central Washington, central Oregon around carrot seed production because of that overlapping season. Carrot seed crops overlap by three months, three weeks. So you're, you're busy combining, blowing air, all this inoculum into the air when your next season's crop is up and emerging. Okay. Beets, this is a classic example. Whidbey Island, I, just like spinach, uh, table beet seed production only takes place in Western Washington and Western Oregon. And we plant the seed on Whidbey Island. Um, every, every company does in July, in June. The plants grow up and in the fall, they, they bury them in, in under soil. So they're nicely insulated through the winter so the roots don't freeze. And then they dig them up and transplant them out at wider spacing in the spring. And you end up with a deep seed crop. There's just a jumble of racemes and seed on them. And then they come through and swath it and combine it. Now in the 1950s, the beet seed industry, and the beet seed industry has been here for over 100 years in Western Washington. A lot of folks from Europe, when they came out and settled here, they brought, they recognized the similarity in the climate, latitude, uh, things like cabbage seed, uh, beet seed all started up in the 1800s in, in Skagit County. Um, they, in the 1950s, they started actually during World War II, the late 40s, they started seeing beet seed yields just plummet. And they didn't know why. And they were getting 10% of the beet seed they should have. And they had a pathologist come out from Wisconsin who quickly recognized it was some virus diseases carried by aphids. Now, beets are biennial, and the overlap, temporal overlap, is three months. All right. You seed your st what's called a stock seed in June, and you harvest the following year in September or even October, depending on how long it takes for that variety to mature. So when the, the, the last season's crop is getting ready to finish maturing, they, the crop dries down. Where do those aphids fly off? Yeah. To the new one. And then you're carrying viruses with them. So the, the aphids were spreading this. So as a result, since that time, since the 50s, the entire beef feed industry, all the companies agreed that they will do their first season of the biennial season on Whidbey Island in the Evie's Landing area. Everyone does it. There's no beets on the mainland during the winter, and they all transplant out in the spring, completely resolve the issue with those viruses. No sprays needed. Huh. Sprays don't work anyway for that virus. And, um, so, you know, expensive logistically a nightmare for companies to have to coordinate multiple landowners and farmers, and but it works and it's gotten rid of the virus problem. So that's on a fairly large scale, but you can think about it in your own yard if you've got your landscape, if you've got issues that show up separating potential hosts and not having them side by side can be really important. Um, oops, so crop rotation. Um, now this is obviously in the landscape situation with perennials, that's not quite the same solution for management, but if you're dealing with annuals or dealing with shorter term crops, crop rotation can be really important for disease management. The pathogens have to survive somehow in the absence of a host. Some pathogens survive a long time in the absence of a host, particularly soil-borne pathogens. Foliar pathogens, pathogens that really only cause diseases above ground, typically don't survive very long in the absence of a host, and particularly if you bury that residue in the soil. Um, so we'll talk a bit about that, but the amount of time that you need to rotate out of a crop is dependent on these very things. What's the host range? If you've got a lot of other hosts around, you might rotate for five years out, but if your neighbors are all the same crop, it's not going to help. Uh, as I mentioned, the foliar versus soil-borne aspect is really important. Soil-borne pathogens like Fusarium, Verticillium, Pythium, they've evolved to survive in the soil environment. And they might persist for a few years, like Pythium. They may persist for 30 years. So white rot on garlic, white rot on garlic and onion, you can have no alliums in that field for 30 years, you will still have white rot in that field. Okay. Because it only goes to alliums. And that forms these fruiting bodies, these are uh, resting bodies for sclerotia that sit in that soil and won't respond, won't germinate and respond to anything except allium root exudation. So you have to have an allium crop growing, exuding these sulfur compounds, triggers those sclerotia to now become active. So it's a real bane for people in, that produce garlic because you can also spread the sclerotia on the toes. So if you share garlic, Always inspect them really carefully. Okay. Um, you also want to uh, think about resistance. If you've got good resistance, then maybe you don't have to rotate so long because you can plant a resistant variety. 
Um, be aware that sometimes weeds can be hosts. Well, black rot, how many brassica weeds do we have in this area? Yeah. A lot. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's the reason some of these things can persist. Um, powdery mildews. I know that powdery mildews are a big issue in landscaping and gardening. <laughs> so I'm just, we all know our powdery mildews are true fungi. They're not water molds. They're uh, foliar pathogens. They're not evolved to survive in the soil. So if you've had a foliar, uh, a powdery mildew problem, and you, let's say you're dealing with an annual, um, before, this is just a close up of what that white stuff that you're looking at, this is what it consists of. It's growing on the surface of the plant and it makes these chains of spores or individual spores that are designed to be picked up in the wind and blown around. So powdery mildews can blow around. They, they blow around in very, very easily and quite far. <laughs> Um, but those spores don't survive very long. They're thin walled, they don't have pigmentation, so they can't survive intense light for too long or heat. Um, so in the winter time, these powdery mildew fungi produce these little structures, tiny little brown to black balls, and they have all this interesting kind of ornamentation around them. They're very pretty, not microscopic. <laughs> but this is its winter survival structure. So these are much more hardy. Um, they also not so bond, but they'll persist on residues. And if I broke open these fruiting bodies under a microscope, you would see inside them sacs. And each little sac usually has eight spores inside it. And it's going through what we call sexual reproduction inside this. So it's genetically recombining. And then those spores get shot out in the spring. And that is constantly, you know, mixes up the genetics of the population. So it makes it more robust to be able to survive under the various things we try to do to the fungus. So every winter it's going through its sexual re reproduction stages, sort of recombining genetically and also persisting in these fruiting bodies. So one of the ways you can manage powdery mildews is to get rid of infected residues. How do you do that? You can bury them. The residues don't, the residues break down much quicker if they're buried than if they're left on the soil surface. Why is that? What breaks the residue down when you bury them? Mostly microbial degradation. There's a lot more microbial activity in the soil than there is on the surface of the soil. So burying residues can be really important for reducing inoculum of fo truly foliar pathogens like powdery mildews. Um, the, the issue comes in with perennials where these fruit, these uh, winter uh, fruiting bodies, sexual fruiting bodies, can actually survive on things like bark. So in in you know cherry trees and um, apple trees, the powdery mildew fungus, the, the, these um, sexual fruiting bodies can actually survive in, in the box. So that becomes harder because you're not going to cut your whole tree down. But as far as the leaves go, you can basically bury those or make sure you compost them well, um, and you can get rid of that inoculum pretty quickly. So this is a benefit of foliar pathogens is that you, crop rotation usually doesn't have to be as long. Uh, if the disease shows up really late in the season, it's going to drop those leaves you maybe not need to worry about it because it's almost done with the season. Then. But then you're going to need to get those leaves out of the way at the end and not just keep them sitting, sitting around through the winter because those fruiting bodies are forming the, the spores that will be released in the spring. Okay. Uh, downy mildews. How many of you heard of downy mildews? Okay. So powdery mildews and downy mildews are totally different. Powderies are true fungi. Downy mildews are water molds. Right? So they like cool. They like wet, they produce a swimming spore stage. It's like a little fish almost with a spore with these flagella that swim, swim along. So they need a lot of moisture. Powdery mildews, going back to the other one, really important concept about powdery mildews. They are the only group of fungi that don't like the leaves to be wet. So I, we talk about general rules and principles. Powdery mildews are an exception to the rule when it comes to leaf wetness because Powdery mildews need really high humidity. So you'll see powdery mildew develop when you typically in the fall, because again, you have those warm days, cool nights, humidity spikes every night. So they, it's not the leaf wetness that they like, it's the high humidity. The denser the canopy, the worse the powdery mildew is going to be because humidity builds in a dense canopy. So if you don't have good air movement through, you've got things crowded in your yard, powdery mildew is going to be worse. But they actually don't like leaf wetness. So one of the ways you control powdery mildews is to water and get the canopy wet. 
which is a totally counter to 99% of other fungi, where leaf wetness is going to drive the disease. So recognizing what it is you have is really important because the worst thing you can do with downy mildew is get your canopy wet because it's just providing the moisture that drives downy mildews. But this is a close-up um, microscope photo I took of the downy mildew pathogen on spinach. Um, it produces these structures that look like deer antlers. There's the spores that come out through the lower surface of the leaf. This is the upper surface of the leaf. This is the lower surface. This is just thousands of these sporangia spores, they call them, with these spores that get blown around in the wind. Okay. And there's a range of downy mildews and different hosts. The other key thing to remember with both downy mildews and powdery mildews is they are host specific. So if you have powdery mildew on your rows and you have peas growing next to them, that powdery mildew is not going to be the same. They're totally unrelated powdery mildews. Powdery mildews are host specific. Downy mildews are host specific. That's a good thing. But what it does tell you, someone will say, well, it looks like it's spreading because I'm seeing powdery mildew in all these hosts. What it tells you is the environment's favorable for powdery mildews. It's not because the powdery mildew is spreading between, it'll spread between hosts of the same species, but not between totally unrelated hosts. So you may think it's spreading, but what it's telling you is we have really good conditions of typically those high humid nights in the fall that we see. Uh, pathogens that are so long, I'll just refer to a few of these damping off pathogens. How many of you have problems when you're trying to grow seedlings and they just don't make it? <laughs> One of the most common causes is pythium. Um, pythium is a water mold, it's not a true fungus. Um, it, this is a photo I took of a root. Um, you can see these dark, uh, these, they're, not, they're dark because the root's dark, but these very round uh, structures, these are called the oospores. Oomycetes form oospores, the, the water molds, and these are, enable them to persist in the root tissue and persist in the soil for a couple of years, but then they germinate and they also produce a swimming spore stage. So pythium needs a lot of soil moisture, so heavily drained soils, um, clay soils, excessively wet areas are going to favor uh, damping off. So if you are wetting your seedlings too much, you're going to favor damping off. So it's important to not overwater because pythium is the most common cause of damping off. Those roots, when they're very soft and succulent, those new roots coming out, those are highly susceptible to pythium. Once you get mature, fully sized roots, pythium doesn't do a lot of damage anymore. It's a young seedling phase. So getting them through the first month or so of growth is critical to try and manage damping off. There are other damping off pathogens like um, Fusarium, Rhizoctonia. They don't care if it's very wet or not. If you've got enough moisture to grow your crop, they, they're going to have enough moisture to do their damage. So they tend to like it warmer, whereas Pythium likes it cooler and wet. And so we have this seedling problem in the springs. So, yeah. Um, white rot, I mentioned this earlier on, the, the bane of allium growers. So um, when you see white rot in the field, oh, in your garden, you'll see these areas where the plants are dying and just not thriving. Um, when you pull them up, you'll, it'll look like the soil is sticking to the the bulbs to the bottom of the plant. And that's because if, if you can see how I pulled one apart and partially cut the, the um, this was actually an onion plant. And you can see there's all this white mycelium of the fungus and all these tiny black structures, see there's like pinhead size that are called sclerotia and they form them by the millions. And those stick, the soil sticks to those. And that's why it looks like the, the garlic or the onion is just dirty because everything's sticking to them. Those sclerotia are what will sit in that soil decades until you plant an allium. And as an allium, whatever kind it is, garlic, leek, onion, as it's germinating, it releases these sulfur compounds that trigger those sclerotia to say, my host has arrived, I'm gonna germinate. It doesn't matter what you grow in between there, it'll just sit there until an allium starts to grow and release exudates. So there's an interesting, you know, managing this is a real problem because it's soil born. So you move soil, you move it, you move cloves of garlic, you share them at a farmer's market or wherever, and someone wants to plant them out, um, you, you have a problem. So really important to try and keep it out um, and avoid infested fields. So as I said, if I go to a farm where the white rod exists, I take booties, I take alcohol, I do everything. So when I leave the field, before I leave the field, I get to the edge of the field, take everything off that goes into landfill, unfortunately. <laughs> and then I spray um, my boots and my hands with alcohol and make sure I'm not carrying anything back. And do not drive into the field because those tires will now be carrying white rot infested soil. Okay. 
Um, removing plants if it's a very low level, but you know that the inoculum is going to be increasing. This pathogen likes it pretty cool on moderate temperatures. It doesn't like heat. It doesn't like really cold conditions. So waiting till it's a little warmer can help. Um, I won't go into the chemical side of it, but from the um, grower side, there's a number of things that they can use. Um, there is a very interesting approach to controlling this called germination stimulants. So I mentioned these ferocia don't germinate until you plant an allium crop. So there's been a tremendous amount of work and some very, very effective work looking at how can you tri trick those scrotia to germinate and think there's an allium crop. Well, one of the ways you can do that is to spray garlic juice. And it works. You have to have a lot of garlic juice. <laughs> but um, I'll, I'm just going to go, these don't really work in our climate. We, we don't, we're not warm enough for soil solarization. Flooding can help, but it's got to be for an extended time, and that doesn't really work with most people's vegetable gardens. And there is no good resistance, unfortunately, in commercial alum species. So here's a picture of garlic juice. Um, it's a company down in California, the garlic company, that actually sells garlic juice. And it works really well. Um, so you have to apply it. The squirrels should think there's a host, they start to germinate, there's no host, they die. Um, there used to be a product called Alley Up. Um, it's, a, it's a synthesized product, not the juice. It's a dialyl disulfide compound, but it's now become just way too expensive. And it was brought out by a big company and they increased the price and growers can't use it. So tricking the fungus into thinking it has a host is a good way, but it, you have to follow the rules. If you apply it too soon after you see a white rod in your garden, it's not going to work. So those sclerotia have a dormancy period of about three months. So if you apply it right after you harvest your garlic, you're not going to trick them into germinating. So don't you have to wait till the next season. If you've got volunteers growing, you don't want to be using, you want to get those volunteers out of your garden. Um, and you have to wait for a couple of months after you treat it before you can plant. So this is thinking a little bit down the road. You have to apply it when the soil is not too cold and not too hot. <laughs> Those sclerotia will only germinate between about 50 and about 70, 75 Fahrenheit. So you want to apply it when it's not too cold, when it's not too hot. So it works really effectively, but you have to follow the rules. You have to understand the pathogen. You have to understand the disease cycle. And then you can recognize the Achilles heel and how to do it. Um, so basically, it's a pretty good effective way if you've got a small amount of aliens in your garden and you have white rod show and show up, you can try to try to do this. Clubroot. How many of you have seen clubroot or brassicas? Okay. This is the bane of Western Washington, small scale farmers and gardeners. <laughs> um, it likes acid soils. We tend to have acid soils. It loves wet. Um, it produces a swimming spore stage. Um, and so this is a picture taken in Western Washington uh, uh, in a cabbage field. And you can see that this is an effective plant. When, when you look around the base, you start to see these clubs that are showing. And this is dug it up. And the roots are just filled with millions and millions of spores forming of the pathogen. And it does well in soil. It survives well for a while, a long time. Um, as I said, it produces the swimming stage. It does well. Um, it's a little bit about the life cycle and how it moves around. And how do you manage it? Okay, so I've got I've listed here a couple of references where you can find details. Um, sanitation is really important. So if you work for a co-op or part of a co-op and you're growing or you're sharing seedlings, really important to make sure you're starting with clean media if you're producing seedlings for transplants, clean trays, clean water. Um, you, you shouldn't be composting this, these roots because they are designed to survive well in the soil. And those clubs are pretty big and just don't break down very well. Cleaning off your equipment, uh, pressure washing your equipment if you're going to move it from field to field, um, controlling your brassica weeds, uh, you need long-term rotation. But a really important thing here is to apply calcium carbonate. What does calcium carbonate do? Raises pH. This fungus does not, it's not a true fungus, but... <laughs> All of the fungus does not do well in alkaline soils. It does better in acid soils. So commercially, growers will apply agricultural limestone calcium carbonate to try and shift the pH up towards neutral or even alkaline if they can. Okay. So some good, good uh, options there, but it's a, it's a bane. And just be really careful about sharing and moving soil from fields that are infected. Uh, how do you get rid of inoculum? Sometimes, you know, you can rake up infected leaves or material and get, get rid of it. Um, 
There are ways that you can try to reduce inoculum, things like burning. It used to be a white practice that you burn fields after you harvested um, to get to burn those stubble because the stubble was affecting the pathogens. More and more that doesn't happen because of you know ecological and environmental issues associated with burning. So some diseases that used to not be a major problem for growers have become a problem since burning has no longer is no longer allowed in most areas, and they've had to learn how to manage that inoculum in other ways. Um, there's even uh, some practices that talk about vacuuming fields. Uh, <laughs> there's things like ergot. Um, you might have heard of ergot that infects grains. Um, it produces LSD type compounds. The Salem witch trials used to be thought to be tied to eating ergot infected rye. In Europe, um, back in the Middle Ages, there was a lot of rye eaten. Uh, rye is really susceptible to ergot. Fungus produces these structures in the seed heads. That gets mixed in with the grain and milled. You eat it. It's basically LSD. Um, now, they've actually synthesized there's medicine that's derived from LSD from these, and it's been carefully meted out doses for treating various conditions. But uh, this, you can vacuum out this ferocia and get them out of that field. And if, it's all on a small scale, you know, it's not going to work on, on giant scales. But um, that's a really interesting disease if you want to read about the history of this interaction with the Salem Witch Trials and some of what was thought to have maybe driven some of that um, crazy situation. Uh, soil solarization really doesn't work in our climate. You have to have like an Arizona, California, <laughs> Texas climate to start to get into that. But certainly covering soil with a clear uh, plastic so that the light can penetrate through, you get more heating of the soil than you would with black because black reflects light. Yeah. Plastic lets the light in, and then it actually heats the soil more. Um, fumigation, obviously, not in a gardening situation, you're not going to fumigate, but there is biofumigation that you can think about. So biofumigation, anyone know what that is? So it's using biological form of fumigation. So, um, oops, actually, I have it later on. So if you grow, um, when you bite into arugula or mustard, and you get that hot flavor, um, it's releasing a biological fumigant. Now, you're not going to die from it because the dose is so low, but when you bite into it, you basically are breaking the cells open and you're releasing an enzyme that converts these compounds called glucosinolates into the hot mustard flavor. That, that, and those, must, those compounds in a high enough dose will actually kill fungi and, and bacteria and weed seed even. So there are crops that are grown for biofumigation purposes. So varieties of mustards, Arugula are selected to be really high in these glucosinolates so that when you, you incorporate them into the soil, you don't harvest them, you basically break down the tissue, incorporate it into the soil. It releases these bio, biological fumigant properties that help kill off some of the bacteria and fungi and, and weed seed. Um, you, have to have, you have to select ones that are really hot. You wouldn't want to eat. <laughs> uh, and and you, basically, they work quite well to get some of your disease pressure down. It's used quite a bit in central Washington. Potato growers struggle with verticillium, verticillium wilt. And after um, big, the season before potatoes, some of them will plant these mustard biofumigant crops. They get really tall because the heat over there, by the time fall comes, they're about this tall. And they just flail more and incorporate it straight away. And it helps kill knock down the verticillium population in the soil. So there's something you can think about if you have some of these cell-borne pathogens. I've got here an illustration of two foliar pathogens on spinach that we struggle with in Western Washington. Um, they can be seed-borne, they're problematic. Um, and what we discovered is that um, after harvest of a spinach seed crop, some of that seed is left on the ground, it doesn't get into the combine, and it grows in the wintertime. And we've discovered that some this this fungus cladosporium will actually cause lesions on these volunteers that are present in the field in, through the winter. Um, and then the, the residues from the stems of these spinach seed crops are kind of woody. And the other fungus, stymphiliums, they're not cladosporum, but stymphilium will form these sexual fruiting bodies, just like I showed you before with the powdery mildew. And they'll shoot out their spores in the spring, and that's inoculum for the next season. So we were able to demonstrate this to growers in their fields, finding these volunteers and, and residues, taking it back to the lab, isolating these pathogens, showing how long those residues can continue to shoot those spores out. If you leave them on the surface of the soil, they'll shoot those spores out for over a year. Okay. So one of the key things for, we've been able to use this to help growers manage these diseases is when you're done harvest at the end of the fall, incorporate those residues. 
Don't let the volunteers sit there all winter. Don't let the residue sit on the surface of the soil. If you bury them, those fruiting bodies do not form. They only form where they're exposed to the air on the surface of the soil. So you can significantly reduce the amount of inoculum in an area. Um, that, that's the uh, fruiting bodies up close. I call them the Hershey's kisses of death <laughs> because it gets one of those sacks with all the eight spores and they literally get shot out like cannonballs into the air. So we take petri plates and invert them over the residues with about a, a half inch gap and all the spores get shot out and land on the petri plate as an agar medium and that's how we isolate the fungi. So it's kind of fun thing to do in the lab. <laughs> so um, I talked about these soil-borne pathogens that are really a bay and they're recalcitrant. They're really hard to manage because they well they survive well in our soils. So this is a photo I took of a, a former PhD student who just graduated in December and a former postdoc in a spinach seed crop in Skagit County. That field had not had spinach for 18 years. So this is a hybrid spinach seed crop. So there's male rows and there's female rows. Spinach is dioecious. It naturally forms separate male plants from female plants. So you can very easily make a hybrid by selecting which male line you want, which female you want they cross in the field. This field, you can see the female rows are all dying. They should be at least thigh high. So this field had not had spinach in 18 years. And this grower told me that she lost 75% yield. This is a commercial spinach seed crop worth a lot of money. And she said, Lindsay, I would have planted in the field next door if I'd known this disease was still a risk. So we actually every year uh, have done, well, for, for about 18 years, we've been doing research to try and help growers manage this disease because we have to grow spinach seed in Western Washington and Western Oregon. That's the only area of the right climate for spinach seed production. Otherwise, we, we can't grow it in this country. So we've been doing all kinds of work to try and chip away at the recalcitrance of this pathogen. We'll never eradicate this pathogen because it does so well in our acid soils of this area. It loves acid. So we've done a whole series of trials looking at calcium carbonate amendment. How much calcium carbonate can you use that's cost effective, that helps reduce the disease? It doesn't start creating all kinds of other physiological problems when you shift pH too high. We've done all kinds of trials with uh, parts of students' projects. But you can see this is uh, where we were growing a female line that was highly susceptible, like that one you saw in the picture, one that it was intermediate and one that was partially resistant. And you can see the yields. This is marketable yield. It's metric, sorry, kilograms per hectare. This is similar to pounds per acre, actually, the conversion rate. And you can see how with using limestone, we can get very, very significant improvements in yield by shifting that pH and, and looking at how to balance the nutrient availability in the soil. Um, so still haven't eradicated it, but have been able to chip away from a 10 to 15 year rotation down to about 50% of that if growers use limestone correctly. So um, mustard biofumian crops, we mentioned that early on, this is a trial we did to try and control fusarium. We grew these mustards, you flail mow them and immediately incorporate them because as you flail mowing, what are you doing? You're releasing. It's a volatile, so you want to immediately incorporate it. So don't mow it one day and come back the next day and incorporate it because you've lost. It's all volatilized. Okay, but this is one way that you can try and control some of these recalcitrant soil borne pathogens. Um, other cultural practices we talked about: water can driving these diseases. So irrigation, um, bacteria and fungi and water molds love moisture. If you can avoid getting the canopy wet, except for powdery mildews, <laughs> then you can help control these diseases. This is the photo I took in central Washington. I teach a summer class in field plant pathology. I took the students to uh, meet this grower who's kneeling down on the ground. He's raising a bean seed crop. And this is a disease that can affect beans, can get on the seed. It's a quarantine disease, it requires crop destruction. This grower had to have a crop destroyed several years prior to my taking the students out there. He has switched from using, um, he was using flow irrigation or center pivot irrigation. He now uses drip irrigation. That entire field is under drip irrigation. Big change, but he no longer has problems with that disease because you're not splashing the bacteria around. So it's all about trying to control how long the canopy stays wet, uh, minimizing splash dispersal, and trying to lower humidity in the canopy. So as I mentioned here, in a case like this, drip irrigation is your best because you least amount of all of that, followed by furrow, followed by overhead um, if you have to irrigate. Sometimes the economics and the practicality don't work for switching your, your time.